Hello, hello. I am back. And this is one of my podcast episodes from my car. So bear with me with some background noise. I am emerging from a pretty dark place that started at the end of December. And I was able to get a couple of podcasts out in between. But between COVID, isolation, some very specific things with both of my children mental health wise that were pretty critical and then that effect on me and then surgery with my younger daughter it's just been like kind of one thing after the other and honestly this has just been a really really intense time for everybody but if you're extra sensitive energetically holy cow it's just been a lot and probably if you're listening to this you're one of those people And so this is no surprise to you. So I really just had to take a step back. It's funny, I started a group, and I mentioned this in the Lundy Bancroft interview. I started like a local meetup. Um, I was all energized and ready to go and meet like-minded people. And this thing, this darkness, just had such a grip on me. And it felt like when I would claw my way out of it and get to a better place, then something else would pop up and... It was just a really, someday I'm going to write a book is all I'm going to say. I want to protect the privacy of my kids and the people in my life. So I don't want to say too much, but I mean, I can imagine that if this is what I'm going through, granted, I do not have parents around and family to support me, but I know that other people are going through this. And honestly, I'm grateful right now that I am not in a nine to five job or contract because there's no way I would be able to ever be there for my kids the way that I was able to through this really dark time. And uh, I just recorded an interview with Amy Wong that I will share here and sent out a newsletter about my trip. I was able to really quite miraculous take a trip to Florida right before my daughter's surgery and right after my other daughter's pretty intense breakdown. We all had a breakdown, I'll just say that. And so I'm sharing this because I actually asked my friend when that went out to the list, I I asked my friend if if it was tone deaf, I said, do you think that me saying I went to Florida is like not being tuned in? And she's like, oh God, no. And the thing is, I really just wanna keep, things are so dark in the world and I believe that with so much bad news around us, I want to share good news. I mean, I went through such a incredibly dark place to be able to emerge out of that. And I had my own breakdown and breakthrough probably about a week and a half before we went to Florida. And I just came out the other side saying, you know what, I'm going. You know, there were other plans that were supposed to happen that fell through with my kids and their dad and their passports didn't work out. So I was like, I'm going to make this work. And I did make it work. And it was beautiful. There were parts of it that were not so beautiful because my kids are not great with transitions. And, you know, there was some dysregulation, not so great behaviors. But overall, oh my God, just amazing to be able to be in the sun, get out of the darkness and the isolation of where we live and just be on the beach and grounding in the waves and the sand and the salt air and wake up every morning to sunshine and for four of those days we were at a hotel that was literally overlooking the water so it was glorious sunrise and sunset and yeah and I was there during my mom's birthday she's deceased but it was cool to be so close to where we lived for one year we lived in Florida and we lived in four places in one year and the last part we lived in Clearwater And I was staying in Tampa, but I went to Clearwater Beach twice um, while I was there. So it was really, I don't know, it was just being, being that she was a single mother and that she took this adventure with us as kids and brought us there. She was a missionary starting a church. She also worked for radio stations. It was, oh my gosh, this nomadic 1970s, kind of bizarre in hindsight, but I loved it. It was an adventure and my brothers do not have the best memories of some of it we talked about that but anyway it was just really wonderful to be there so this episode I 
am going to just get real with you and say that I've been thinking, I've had time to really think about my own purpose, this podcast, what I want to do, courses, and I think I've been really split between my techie marketing start a business side and my self-help my heart for moms and single moms and women trying to transition and get ahead and I keep you know thinking I've got to make a decision but they really do overlap and so I am taking it one day at a time but I'm going to start trying to connect with you individually so at the end of this episode and in the show notes there's going to be a link to sign up for a 10 to 15 minute quick call with me if you're willing and interested to just have a chat to see what it is that you are most struggling with, what it is you did struggle with if you left a toxic relationship. I have this course that is very close to done and there's a part of me that feels like there's something missing and I really want to just talk to anyone who's thinking about leaving a relationship but feels they're not sure how to make that happen or what are your biggest fears around that or if you left and maybe there are some things big epiphanies you had or things that were surprising that you wish you had known about or things that you found along the way that you would you wish you could share with other women and mothers those are the kinds of things or maybe you're still searching for me I know I'm, there's some things I'm still searching for and I've been out eight years now so this episode I'm sharing one of those things with you that I wish I knew and this one is from a I believe that her title is well she's talking about neurobiology and trauma and she's a psychiatrist and she does trainings online on YouTube you can find her and I have reached out I'm going to reach out to her to see if she could be on the show But there's so many episodes, I don't even know which one to choose to really focus on to say, go look at it. But this one in particular stuck out and really struck a chord with me because here's the thing. When you're, and I don't say this to anybody who's still in a toxic marriage or relationship with whatever the scenario is, whether it's a coworker, a family structure, but if you're in it and then you, you go, okay, that's it, and you leave, But you've been in it and you've been walking on eggshells or you've been threatened or you're isolated, manipulated, gaslighted, gaslit, and there's been coercive control over you and you are like in it saying, I got to get out. I know that there's a better way for my life. And then you get out and you're like, okay, I broke free. I'm free. But you're still feeling so many of the things that you're feeling. Your system feels like it's still in fight or flight. You're still looking over your shoulder. And, you know, sometimes legitimately you should be because there's maybe, you know, an ex that you're still co-parenting with or a family member that is still very much in your life and you can't fully extricate yourself from that situation. But the fact that you're not sleeping under the same roof with them or, you know, cohabitating, sharing a bed should, in theory, give you, give you a sense of freedom and peace. And mostly, I think for most of us it does. But there can be this lingering thing where you're like, okay, I thought that when I got out, everything would be better. I thought that I would feel free. I thought that I would feel energized. I have all these ideas for what I want to do with my life. Like for me, I wanted to start this podcast. I knew that I wanted to start a business. I knew that I wanted to land in a happy, supportive community. I knew that I wanted to travel more. I knew that I wanted to take better care of my body and my sleep. I knew that I wanted to have more variety in my life because my life was very mundane, very ritualistic very much living on trolley tracks. So there were some of those things that I could do immediately and I could start working on. But still, I I struggled. I really struggled to focus. I struggled to maintain consistency with many things. I still felt this kind of overwhelming sense of anxiety, fear, trepidation. I felt really still connected to 
the, the, pro, the situation I was in before. Even though my body knew I was out, I still felt it. And so I was watching this video, and I've talked to you guys about doing EMDR and how that helped me, but... about trauma and the psychological impact of trauma on the brain and I have actually been looking at traumatic brain injuries I had I got hit by a truck on my bike and knocked to the ground and I never really had my head examined so to speak I had my they checked my eyes the rest of my body I was more concerned about an ankle that got x-rayed but I never went to the doctor after that which is not very smart anytime you're slammed to the ground by a two or three ton vehicle you probably should go get checked out by your primary care doctor that's another long story and then I also slipped and fell this fall in October when my like right before something with my it was a big appointment with my daughter I was under a lot of stress because she had to have an MRI and it was a second attempt and she's afraid of needles so I was like there was a lot going on and I slipped and fell in a shower basically had something called hot shower syndrome so I fell and hit the back of my head I was fine or so I thought but I have had some challenges to memory just I could laundry list them and after I see a doctor I'm probably going to get some scans to check to see what's going on with my brain but what I want to say is that the, now that I've learned a little bit more about traumatic brain injuries and the things that can happen with your brain, I understand a bit more about how both a concussion and trauma, living through a traumatic situation, can severely impact your memory, your cognition, your emotions, your ability to self-regulate, all of those things. And so this, while I was looking into those things, this other video came up by a woman named Docs. They call her Doc Snipes. She does CEUs for people who are psychiatrists, psychologists, I believe. So continuing education credits through YouTube. And she has these amazing that have PowerPoint slides and I've just learned a ton about so many different things. But this one in particular was really of interest to me because this one, I'm trying to actually pull it up while I'm on my phone. We'll see if this works. This one was called The Neurobiological Impact of Psych Psychological Trauma on the HP Axis. I'm, I'm probably getting that wrong. It's the, it's the threat avoidance part of the brain. And I'm going to send it. Not send it. I'm going to put it in the show notes so you guys can check it out. Her video is excellent. She references actual research. That's probably... Recording stopped. She references a study that she even says is really hard to follow, even for somebody who understands this stuff. But what I took from it, and what I think is really important, is that she says that the trauma that you experience not just PTSD, but just trauma in general can alter your brain. Everybody experiences the same things differently based on many other factors. And some of the factors that make trauma more traumatic for people are things like where it happened, like in your safe zone. So if your trauma happened at home, which most people feel safe at home, it can be way more impactful than something that happened when you're on vacation or in another city or another location where it's not your safety zone. And then the same is true for work. You know, hopefully you're comfortable at work, you feel you feel safe at work or school. So the traumas where they happen are much more impactful. Your relationship to the victim, obviously the victim's you, that's 
you're in it. But if it's a child or your animal or your aunt or your uncle or your niece or nephew, that's going to have an impact on you because of your closeness to that other person or your similarity to them. And then the other thing is the, the amount of support you get at that time and, and other factors in your life leading up to the, the traumatic event. So support is super important. And then some of the other things that she mentioned are the HPA access, is I believe what she calls it again, it's that threat response part of your brain. Well, if you spend a lot of time hanging out in that place, the biochemical impact on your brain can alter your brain. And this is me paraphrasing because I am not a neurobiologist. That's why I'm going to send you to this. But I'm going to loop back and tell you why I think this is super important for you to know. For me, when I heard this, one of the things that she said was because it's altered, it's like the impression I got was that you're not going to be able to focus or learn new things with this type of damage. It's going to be very difficult for you. And it's not that you can't heal and, I guess, fix this aspect of your damage to your brain, which, again, is very similar to a traumatic brain injury. But while you're in it, while you're in that place, without having somebody to help you through it, you could start to think that this is there's something that's your fault or it's wrong with you. So if we leave somebody who is abusing us, emotionally abusive, controlling, coercive, sexually abusing, physically abusing, and we're out of that situation or removed from it, we could think, oh, everything's great. But then when we have high hopes for ourselves, like, oh, everything's going to be better when I'm out of the situation, but we end up having this cognitive emotional issue and we cannot focus we cannot do those things we dreamed of doing or hoped we could do while we were stuck in that situation now the barriers meaning the abuser themselves are maybe removed out of our lives even a little bit and we're in a better place we're sleeping better we're eating better we're safer we're not walking on eggshells 24 7 it can be very easy when we don't have that person or that circumstance to point to, it can be very easy to blame ourselves. So then we start to think that maybe, oh, maybe something is wrong with me. Maybe I am broken. Or I thought it was going to get better. I thought I was going to get better. But there's very real stuff that you're dealing with still. There's very real damage potentially to your brain based on this long-term effect of being in that circumstance, being around that person and being impacted by that abuse and that trauma, whatever it is. I wish I had known this. I wish I had known this. This is eight years later and I know all the things that I went through where I struggled with trying to stay focused, trying to accomplish things that I, that I knew I was 100% capable of, but I just couldn't do it and I know at the end of my when I was leaving the relationship and in court and all those really horrible things with trying to find a place to live trying to take care of my kids trying to get therapists for my kids trying to get other therapy for my kids trying to find daycare trying to find adequate housing trying to get the right school schedule set up trying to do my job and there was no leave when I worked at that time in in Massachusetts there was no specific leave for domestic violence I didn't have any I had understanding from my coworkers, but I didn't have anybody say, you know what, you need to regroup, take a week, get your stuff together and take care of yourself. And if honestly, if I could have done that, I would have probably slept. I would have found an, a better lawyer because I would have had time, had time to find a lawyer who actually knew domestic violence and knew restraining orders and all of that stuff. And I ended up not being able to do that because of the circumstances I was in and the urgency of the situation and the deadlines with, oh, you're going to be in court in like four days. Hurry up, get a lawyer. So when you have your ducks in a row and you have some adequate support, you are going to be able to find the right people to support you through 
what could become a really long process. And I'm sharing this with you because I really hope that other people can learn from what I experienced. And I'm not even going to call it a mistake because you don't know what you're getting into. You're doing the right thing for yourself, the right thing for your kids. And you're just doing the best that you can. And I looked and I searched. I'm a really good researcher. (laughs) And I did not find resources that would have helped me. Specifically something like this. Hey, you're experiencing something that is... 100% traumatic, as are your children, you need this type of support. I didn't even have a therapist for myself because I was so focused on my children and their mental health. And obviously, you know, put on your oxygen mask, you got to find somebody for yourself. And honestly, I did try my, my best to find somebody for me, but finding somebody who had the right background and the right understanding of the context and what the impact of leaving could be on me, my mental state, my children's mental health, what it would mean potentially going forward, how we could stay protected, how we could stay in a support group and not lose touch and feel totally alone and scared because family distances themselves from you when they don't want to get involved. People who are supporting you all throughout can just disappear suddenly and not really give you an explanation and you can feel completely alone and if you have family members who are alive and can help you like parents like that's wonderful please 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 just treasure that because that is not the case for everyone and to have that kind of support is just outstanding whether it's just emotional support or if it's emotional it's time there maybe they're helping with take care of your household, your kids, your dog, maybe even they're helping you financially with bills, all that stuff. I mean, that's huge. So if you can get support, both mentally and support, like a support group, all of the support groups that I looked at where I ended up living, they were, some of them were closed completely during the summer, which I thought was just absolutely ludicrous. And then when I lived in this new place, I didn't have anybody to babysit my kids. I didn't. They were a long distance away. Some of them, I know for a fact, some support groups do have um, babysitting. But the ones that I were, you know, reasonably close, like under an hour, did not. And I, I just found it really challenging. And I honestly, if I had known how crucial being in a support group for myself was or would be for my future mental health and that of my kids... I would have prioritized it. I I thought I was doing okay. I really thought most of the time I'm reading all these self-help group, self-help books. I'm starting a podcast. I'm able to talk to some of these authors and experts. And, you know, I knew CBT, DBT probably would have helped me. But I, I did not realize how powerfully affected I could be, we could be by this trauma and I searched for an EMDR person I found that person and I did find a therapist who had an understanding of domestic violence but not not at the level that I needed I needed somebody who understood women and children and the impact of being with a partner who was not happy (laughs) that the relationship dissolved and the dynamics of that and the benefit of being in going to a domestic violence group or shelter and getting just really making sure they load you up with phone numbers and resources and then maybe they check in on you maybe they have a social worker a caseworker somebody so that person checks in on you and makes sure that you are following up and going to meetings or getting whatever support you need for yourself for your kids maybe they can help you with the financial piece the food the clothing all of that stuff that's really important and difficult and I know I was looking for anything like those last two things related to life because I had a job and whatever and I thought oh I can I can make this work and I was very entrepreneurial and I knew I was going to make more money but the fact of the matter is if I had known about certain grants and things for single moms. I know I was eligible. I know all of it would have helped me. 
and so many bills that I was not prepared for. And the other thing is, even if somebody just said, oh, you have good credit, use your credit cards. Or if you have a 0% card for 18 months or 24 months, that can give you some breathing room. Steph, use it. I was so against credit cards. I was, oh my gosh, I to my own demise. But there are times in life when you need space financially to accomplish what we will call a transition time in your life. And I don't believe in running up your credit or destroying your credit or being neglectful, but you do need flexibility, especially when you leave one of those situations. So if you have an amazing credit score and somebody's offering you a 0% credit card, holy crap, that can make a massive difference in your life, getting help for you, getting help for your kids, getting food, like shelter, all of it. Those are some of the things that I talk about in my course, trying to get a financial advisor to be a part of the course as well, because I want to talk about that. And I want to make sure that, that all aspects of financial planning are included, not just the short term, but the long term. And those are all things that like, you know, it's going to be an issue, but if you, and I even went to financial advisors and I didn't have stocks. I didn't have a lot. I had a 401k. I had an IRA. They were just like, eh. They, they just couldn't really help. And I know that there are people out there who can help. But you have to know who to look for. You have to know who can help you out and how to help yourself. If nobody else is willing to give you advice, there are certain things that you can do. So this is a little bit of the, the first time I recorded. I think I've touched on the main things, which is it's really just so essential to have some support for you when you leave. And by that, obviously family, friend, that type of support is great. But if you can find a group, a domestic violence group, anything related to abuse, so they have that very keen understanding that nobody else really gets unless they're in it, it can be very, and if it can be very hard for you in ways that you never imagined. And so if you have them there and you're continuously keeping them in your life through weekly meetings, bi-weekly meetings, whatever it is, whether it's online or in person, I think that that will really set you up for success. Even if you think, you know, like me, here was this middle-class person with a solid job. I feel like I had a lot going for me that many women do not have. But sometimes I feel like it's actually a disadvantage because you're not as likely to seek support. You think, oh, I can do this. But it's you're not having a regular divorce, a regular separation. This is completely different. It's an animal of its own. And so you can't compare yourself to people who just dissolved their marriage but didn't have abuse in it. All of the impact on you, all of the impact on your kids, like all of that stuff. You need people who get it and will give you adequate support and I will put some links. I know that I have some resources that I can put in here. So I'll put in the Doc Snipes video so you can see that. And hopefully that will be validating to you if you've left and you're, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Or maybe you're in it and you're like, wow, thank God I heard about this because I don't want to go through that too. I want to set myself up for success. I want to thrive. I want to take good care of myself and truly, truly heal. And I think this is the way to do it. Like, this is the thing you need to know. And I will put the links for any domestic violence resources that I think will work, regardless of where you are in the world or the United States. And then I will put a link for the sign up. If you're willing to speak to me for 10, 15 minutes, I would love to talk to you about your struggle. Connect, just connect with you and hear what's going on with you. So I'm going to put that in the show notes, look for it. And that's my message. And I really just, am, I want to encourage, but I don't want to mislead. And that has always been in my mind. I don't want to tell people to up and leave without a plan. If you have to up and leave without a plan because of physical violence or other things that are happening, absolutely do that. But then make sure you find the correct support you can as fast as you can. And by correct, I just mean the right support. I mean domestic violence. People who understand domestic violence, coercive control, manipulation, all of that. 
and they can help you. Just ask more of them. Ask them to help you with programs related to the financial piece, helping you with bills, rent, all that stuff. There's never been more available than there is right now with COVID. So many grants are out there right now to help people with the rising cost because of inflation, the COVID stopping people, especially moms from working, losing their jobs. They can help with mortgage payments, taxes, back rent, securing a house, a place if you've been evicted, elect, really high electric bills, things like that. So all kinds of things, even repairs on your home, repairs on your car. I'm exploring a lot of that right now, and I have benefited from a few of the programs that are out there. And honestly, I don't know how I would have been able to get through many of the things that I've been through in the last year or so without that type of support. So I really want to make sure that I share it with you. And some of it's much, much easier to obtain than you would ever imagine. But it does take intention and it takes knowledge to find it. So I'm going to have more about that in my course, but I also will be interviewing somebody who I think will be able to help you with specifically with grants that can benefit you as you transition into the next chapter of your life, regardless of where you are. Maybe you've been out for three years and you've hit this struggle with COVID and parenting and, or job loss or just super inflation. So those are the things I'm going to put in the show notes. Please do look and keep an eye out for future interviews that are specifically about that transitional piece, how to make ends meet, how to take better care of yourself. And for those who have not left, what are the things you need to think about as you make a plan to exit and and take your time until you feel really confident, if you have that ability, if you have that, I won't call it a luxury. That's really what it is, though. It is a luxury. If you can make it for whatever amount of time you need, whether it's three, six months, a year or more, to really feel good about leaving and hitting the ground running and being able to thrive with a support group, that's really what I recommend. Nobody, and I'm going to cry, nobody should have to go through this alone. And I get that, you know, eight years ago, there was much less understanding for this. But now so many people have been through abusive situations. They've made struggles with isolation due to COVID and all of the restrictions with that, losing jobs. So there's a lot more understanding and compassion right now. So take advantage of that and really don't be afraid to ask for help. Don't be afraid to do the research and invest back into yourself that time that you need to do that so that when you get out, you don't feel like you're being re-abused or re-victimized in some way. It is not, not a good feeling. And you can get out from under this and you can set yourself up for success. All right. That's all that I have for today. Just sending you so much love so you're in my thoughts and prayers and um yeah i'm hoping to hear from you directly if you're comfortable and just click the link set up a time again it's going to be short 10 15 minutes i'll probably pick one or two days i haven't even set it up yet one or two days where you can just talk to me like back to back slots and we'll go from there and if you don't want to do a call but you you feel like it would be beneficial for me to hear from you with email you can send me an email as well. If you go to the audaciouslife.com, there's an email form right there that says contact and you can leave a voice or an email from there. I get email all the time from there. So feel free to do that. And that's the best way to reach me. All right. Lots and lots of love to you. I am thinking of you and hang in there. Please hang in there. You will, you will get through this. You will get through this. Lots of love. Bye.